Freedom Abolition is a video series that explores the theories and practical implications of anarchism using thought experiments. This video does not advocate illegal behavior or activities. It is merely a philosophical discussion about hypothetical scenarios. Hello and welcome to another episode of Freedom Abolition. Uh, this video will focus on the phenomenon of structural violence and systems of capitalism. It will also go into the dynamics of the non-aggression principle. Um, this is the principle which anarcho-capitalists and also libertarians have based their philosophies on. Structural violence is a topic that is very relevant concerning recent historical events. Uh, the phenomenon of structural violence within capitalist structures provides strong justification for arguments concerning redistribution of wealth, workplace rights, uh, like rights for women and LGBT workers, and the enforcement of gender pronouns in the workplaces. The justification stems from the history of workplace discrimination against racial minorities, uh, gender-based discrimination, uh, discrimination based on sexual preference or physical appearance in the workplaces and during the hiring process. Structures of ownership exist such that you must essentially be given permission to work at a certain place or to present yourself the way you want within workplaces. And yet you must rely on employment within these workplaces to survive. Over the course of history, state power and the effects of capitalism have allowed specific gendered and ethnic groups to accumulate ownership of most of the means of production. And that makes these groups the gatekeepers to employment, to economic mobility, and thus also to the survival and well-being of most of the population. So anyways, I'd like to start out with the uh, definitions of property, because property is at the is, is, is really central to this discussion. And, uh, Property is the real force behind capitalism. Um, property is the real property rights and benefits from governments provide the real leverage behind any system of capitalism. Uh, if it weren't for the um, provisioning and, and the benefits from governments which protect uh, property, then people wouldn't be able to maintain wealth and, and protect it from from being uh, redistributed among society. So property rights are at the essence of most modern governments. Um, it is a core service and benefit that the governments provide. Um, I, don't, I personally don't like the term rights in that um, what is happening surrounding property is more of a system of benefits that governments provide. And these benefits have to do with the protection of property uh, systems for provisioning property, like saying who owns what, you know, mechanisms for determining who owns what. Um, and er, most people might, might think that, that the mechanisms by which people obtain property is a very natural uh, mechanism and uh, a very straightforward thing. But um, if you look historically, the establishment of rights over property has been Quite complex and even somewhat arbitrary and many times the mechanisms used to determine who gets the rights of the property seem to be biased in favor of, uh, of those with the most power and those with uh, noble backgrounds etc. Um, as an example in the early history of America I'll read an excerpt from this Journal of Law and Policy uh, America's First Nations Origins History and Future of American Indian Sovereignty um, so it says, uh, during the early years when Europe was exploring America, legal scholars were debating the rights of the native people. The explorers encountered uh, this theorist, uh, Franciscus de Victoria, apparently laid the foundation for his country's colonial, colonial theory based upon humane natural law, natural law principles, uh, which would later influence many principles of international law. Victoria argued that the indigenous people of America possess natural legal rights as free and rational people and had inherent rights under natural law to the territory they occupied. You know, whatever natural law means, even though the governments that institute these laws are maybe couldn't be considered natural, they're artificial. Uh, according to the law of nations, the European explorers had no lawful right to dispossess the in Indians of their prior title to the land. So... Uh, these writings apparently were at odds with the law of discovery embraced by the Pope of England and later the United States. The discovery doctrine was based upon the belief that 
America was occupied by heathens and infidels, uh, sinners whose land could be taken by force and without cause. Because I guess apparently it was natural to believe in the Christian religion and their in their uh, interpretation of what is what natural means. Uh, so gradually the discovery doctrine the discovery doctrine came to be recognized as the legal basis upon which Europeans and later the United States could acquire title to the Indians land. And furthermore, the reality of the situation was that um, as the Native Americans outnumbered settlers for several decades, the early colonial governments obtained most of their lands by purchase rather than uh, force or theoretical discovery. So in practice, what actually happened was that whoever had the most power basically had the title to the land. So the point I'm trying to make is that the, the assignment of property is actually quite complex. And there are many different ways to assign properties, many different interpretations of what is natural. So it's not, it's not a very straightforward thing. And there are many different methods of assigning property, establishing property rights, etc. So anyway, uh, there is this concept of property that capitalism really derives all of its leverage from. And, and the leverage is in the form of violence exercised by the state as per the benefits it provides to protect uh, the property of the property owners, whatever that happens to be. It could be intellectual property. It could be uh, property in the form of, of contracts. Um, it could be debt uh, that is owed. Um, it could be uh, physical objects, which I guess people are most familiar with. So uh, there is a principle known as the non-aggression principle, which is uh, espoused by the libertarians and anarcho-capitalists. Uh, essentially, the principle attempts to promote peace and harmony through the denunciation and the, and the justification of retaliation against any uh, so-called acts of aggression. There, there are a number of which you might consider problems with the non-aggression principle. So I, I would like to get into this, and this is to focus on a hypothetical society that has abolished government and only relies on these principles and does not rely on uh, the benefits that governments provide for the protection of property and what life might be like, what, um, how the situations might play out if people were using the non-aggression principle to provision property and to defend property and to structure society around. So there are three things you could do to property which the non-aggression principle classifies as an act of violence. You, you could destroy the property, that would be a violation of the non-aggression principle. It would be considered an act of aggression. So the destruction of property, either partial or total destruction of the property, the alteration of the property, say if you were to graffiti something or um, if you were to label property in, in such a way that the, the owner of the property didn't agree with or didn't uh, give you permission to, um, if you somehow changed the function of the property, changed the appearance of the property, etc., cetera, um, without the permission of the owner, that, that would be alteration, that would be considered an act of aggression uh, by the non-aggression principle and it would justify a violent retaliation against you. Um, and then there would also be theft, which would be the reuse or the confiscation and the possible um, consumption like uh, of the property, like say if uh, it was um, the property con it consisted of like energy um, on, the, on a grid or something and you took the energy from, from somebody, then uh, like you say, you rewired the wires to your house and took the energy, that would be you know a form of theft. Um, you would be consuming the energy, or if you consume somebody's food, that would be theft. Um, uh, it, it, reuse would come into play in, uh, in the case of intellectual property. Um, if you were to reuse the property without somebody's permission, that would be a, a theft. Um, or if you were to confiscate somebody's property, um, say if you were to appropriate their business, um, or if you were to otherwise just take take some physical goods or take a uh, some kind of a, uh, a business structure uh, away from from them, uh, a control structure away from them, if you confiscated it like that, that can be considered an act of theft. And all these things again, they would justify a violent retaliation. Uh, according to the non-aggression principle. So somebody could violently retaliate against you and attack you, kill you. It doesn't go into sp specifics about what the punishments could be um, or what, what the retaliation could consist of for each of these acts. So to clarify things for other people who are familiar with the non-aggression principle, the non-aggression principle goes into things which are more concerned with property, which are extortion, 
which are using the threat of force to convince a third party to transfer their wealth. So like in the case of taxation, adherents of the non-aggression principle consider ex- uh, taxation a form of extortion because governments use the threat of violence to uh, tax you. Like if you don't pay your taxes, then you'll they'll arrest you and take you to prison. That you know They have to violently detain you if you're resisting to take you to prison. So that is a form of uh, violence. It's a, it's a threat of violence um, that they use to get the taxes. And fraud also um, is mentioned by the non-aggression principle. That's the use of deception to convince a third party to voluntarily transfer their wealth. Um, like say you, like in a Ponzi scheme or something like that, um, uh, you know, or you convince somebody uh, like the, like the ICOs, initial coin offerings that we've uh, witnessed in the recent past. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a form of fraud and that again is in violation of the non-aggression principle, but both extortion and fraud, essentially what they do is they result in an act of theft. So really focusing on physical physical um, property, it's, you really have three three things, which are destruction, alteration, and theft. So again, to just to define property, what can property be? It can be physical objects, it can be abstra- abstract ideas, like in the case of intellectual property. It can be contracts, like is in the case of loans. Some have even justified in the past uh, ownership of other persons as property, like in the case of slaves or children. When I mention children, I mean like the parents' uh, ownership of their children. But th- this phenomenon of people owning other people is a little bit outside the scope of this video, so I want to concentrate just on physical objects, abstract ideas, and contracts. Um, you could also consider yourself as property, but that's kind of outside of the scope of this video also. So now I'll focus on structural violence and how it can arise in a system of capitalism, even in an anarchist society. So what if somebody takes up all the land? So what if somebody lays claim to large... Uh, vastly unequal portions of land, somehow ending any up accumulating uh, land as uh, property, and then if other people try to reappropriate the land or use the land without their permission, etc., then then according to the non-aggression principle, they are uh, they are justified in some kind of violent retaliation. And the non-aggression principle says nothing about the amount of property you can own compared to other people and how how obviously disadvantageous that could be to society, um, how much leverage that the accumulation of property can give to a, a small minority of society um, or individuals in society that can be used as a form of, of structure and a form of oppression. So if somebody takes up a bunch of land and leaves only small portions to others, such that these others don't have enough to sustain themselves and must ask permission, to use the landowner's property, then the land landowner and their cronies and their supporters and uh, people that they consider themselves ethnically similar to, etc., uh, could selectively starve those who don't fulfill their demands to fit their cultural preferences, etc., to, to, to meet whatever their demands happen to be. If they don't passively subject themselves to the landowner's exploitation, the landowner could starve those who don't fulfill their demands and, and under the non-aggression principle would be justified to use violence against those who tried to use the the land to try to support themselves. The landowner could use the fact that uh, these people don't have enough to support themselves. They could use access to that land as a form of leverage to exploit and coerce people to do what they whatever the landowner wants. And as I said, the the mechanisms by which people can come to claim property like land, etc can be somewhat obscured sometimes there could it could have been historical systems of fraud historical acts of theft that were used to obtain the property and these things could be considered generationally so far in the past that people don't even consider them theft anymore and somehow recognize the rights of the property with these people despite the history there could be consolidation of land from different owners into the hands of one owner until the one owner owns so much that they, you know they have a vast they've constructed a vastly unequal structure that can again be used to coerce others so this is what we mean when we say structure um, when individuals or small minorities of society can accumulate so much physical wealth they're able to leverage this to contain or coerce other members of society uh, with the potential, not ne- they won't necessarily use it this way, but there is a potential for malevolent action and oppression and coercion.
this can and arguably does get to the point where it is inescapable for members of society who do not possess the wealth and thus these members essentially become slaves to the owners of the structure. The structures can be used to subject members to systems of discrimination based on the morals of the property owner, which is a much more subtle effect that is being struggled against now, as in the case of workplace rights for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals, for instance, uh, as they are forced to be placed in situations which degrade them emotionally to points which could be considered an attack on their persons because they have to be constantly subjected to the pronouns and other behavioral rules such as restriction on what they can wear that their de facto masters have imposed on them in the places they are forced to work for their survival. By this, I mean uh, if there is an oligarchy of property owners who construct contiguous moral rules and social codes of behavior across all the workplaces that they own uh, and they deny work or pay to those who deviate from the behaviors which they consider acceptable, then they have formed a structure from which nobody can escape lest they lose their ability to survive. So if, there is, if they own all of the workplaces and nobody can get a job other places or, or there are so few jobs outside of that that it's not realistic for society in general to be able to escape the structure of this oligarchy, then uh, this oligarchy can effectively starve uh, those who deviate and force and coerce them into exhibiting behavior which they otherwise would not choose to exhibit. So these structures can therefore be considered a form of violent oppression. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the history of anarchism has focused on the elimination of private property and the overthrow of capitalism and the capture of the means of production by the workers and the appropriation of the means of production to the workers. When such large structures form that they are inescapable because one has no other realistic choice but to be included and be invited to participate in order to survive, then the offer of inclusion becomes a form of leverage that can be used to coerce people into adopting behavior which can be fatally detrimental to their mental health or can be used to exterminate and enslave racial or otherwise biologically different groups to those who own the structures. And the examples that I have of this are the domination of men over women, where men uh, have historically owned the means of production. Men have been the only ones to have access to the, to the means of production and to any property, including land. And uh, these structures have been used to systematically exterminate racial groups like African Americans. There were no legal protections for them against hiring discrimination, where it was legal for for the workplaces to deny employment to members of other racial groups, which on a large scale collectively diminished the ability of these people to survive and deteriorated their economic circumstances, forcing them to take lower paying jobs. And when I say fatally detrimental to mental health, uh, people who are gender nonconforming or people whose gender expression doesn't fit the demands of their workplace, uh, maybe subtly discriminated against over long periods of time through the imposition of gender pronouns upon them that which they disagree with uh, through the imposition of dress codes which they are not comfortable with over time this can degrade mental health and cause many problems uh, high suicide rate among trans people and high incarceration rate is not a coincidence um, and this thing print and uh, and phenomena like these are most likely the cause. And therefore, this is why I say the use of these structures to coerce people into behavior they otherwise would not choose to exhibit can be considered a form of violence and coercion, which should be subject to retaliation. Um, not everybody will agree with this. And within a system of anarchism, I think one of the principles, which is a recurring theme in this series, is that different segments of society will have their own interpretations of what coercion means, what constitutes coercion, what constitutes violence, and we'll, we'll uh, adapt different ways of handling these things. Um, I think that there would be federations of different groups between each other that essentially result in treaties between each other. And uh, depending on the, the rules of the federations, these people voluntarily enter into one another. Certain definitions of coercion and violence may or may not violate these, the terms of federation. I'll get into this more in other videos. Actually, I think federation federation is another will be another big recurring theme in this uh, in this series as a 
as a strategy for mitigating violence between different groups. So again, if all the workplaces and means of production are owned by uh, a culturally contiguous oligarchy or a discriminatory oligarchy and property rights have been respected, which allow these, these actors to maintain the property and maintain the control over these systems. What we might think of as the distance that must be traveled to escape the system of workplaces it could be too great to escape and therefore any alternate means of survival have been practically obstructed so that the participation within these workplaces can be used as leverage against anybody effectively because there is no other means of survival. They have to, they have to participate in order to survive. That's why I say that the offer of participation can be used in this case as a form of coercion. And this is the basic problem, that the structure that a system of capitalism has the potential to create can be used to trap people. Uh, so that concludes this video. Um, please make sure to subscribe and like this video if you liked it. Um, hit the bell button if you subscribe so you, you, know, you get notified, whatever. Um, and also, uh, you know, donate to my Patreon. I provide links below in the description to my Patreon. Uh, also to, for PayPal. Um, you know, I, I need as many donations as I can to keep this video series going and thoroughly discuss this topic. Thank you and stay free.